In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> if you think about it, it's probably a little unlikely that the gospel reading for today should wind up on many inspirational posters. The apostles say to Jesus, increase our faith. And Jesus tells him, well, if you had faith... If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell a tree to move itself and be planted in the sea and the tree would obey you. Which I think probably just made the apostles feel worse. Because they'd certainly never had a tree obey them. And so that must mean their faith is not even the size of a mustard seed. Hashtag thanks Jesus. I mean... And to make matters worse, then he goes on with this weird example of a master and a slave. He says that none of you is slave masters. Well, already awkward enough. But none of you is slave masters would see your slave coming in from working all day and have them sit down and give them food and wait on them. Obviously. Of course not. The slave is just doing what the slave is commanded to do. Why would you do something like serve them dinner after they've been working all day? It's kind of hard to see where Jesus is going with all of this. I mean, right? And then he continues and says to the disciples, So in the same way, when you've done everything you you were ordered to do, you should say that we are worthless slaves and have done what we ought to have done. Yeah, I don't think I've seen many inspirational posters with we're worthless slaves. We've done what we ought to have done at the top of them. So we're left with the feeling that apparently, according to this gospel reading... We all have very little faith, smaller than a mustard seed, because we stink and can't do anything. We're a bunch of worthless slaves who shouldn't expect anything, but should just do, just do what we're told to do. This is not a recipe for a sermon that will provoke church growth, I think. And if you dig more deeply into this gospel text, in some ways it becomes even more difficult. You see, the 17th chapter of Luke opened... With Jesus telling the disciples about community, he reminded them that scandals would come, that there would be moments of life in the community that would cause people to stumble. And he urged them to be on guard to ensure that nothing you do ever makes someone new to the community stumble. He says that those who follow him should speak honestly about sin. And above all, those who follow Jesus should be always willing to forgive. In verse 4 of chapter 17, he says, And if the same person sins against you seven times a day, and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. And then our reading starts. And the apostle said to Jesus, increase our faith. See, Jesus is inviting the disciples to live lives of abundant mercy and forgiveness toward one another, toward their enemies. Even if someone sins against you seven times in the same day and seven times says, I'm sorry, you need to forgive them. It is in response to this injunction to forgive the sinner who continually wounds you that the disciples ask Jesus to please increase our faith. And I understand that request. I'd imagine each and every one of us understands that request to have our faith increased in the faiths of such a teaching. Because each of us can imagine someone who's hurt you or offended you over and over again. You know how difficult forgiveness can be. We understand intellectually that when you hold on to a grudge, you hold on to a wound someone has inflicted upon you, that By holding on to it, you're really allowing that person to continue wounding you, to continue to have power over your life. But that when you forgive, you take back your own self-determination, no longer carrying around the pain of what they did to you. Offering grace to your enemy is a way you can stand upright once more. We understand that intellectually. But at the same time, some people are really horrible. And I'd rather not stand upright. I'd rather hold on to that anger, hold on to that grudge. So yes, Lord, increase our faith. Because that kind of forgiveness looks very hard to do. And I think Jesus is actually trying to encourage the disciples here. 
Though his response about faith like a mustard seed feels like kind of a devaluing of the faith of the disciples, the problem, part of the problem at least, is the difficulty in the translation from the Greek. Jesus does not say, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, as though the possibility for such faith existed in the now gone past. Rather, Jesus uses a Greek tense that implies continued action. The verse is better translated, if you have faith, if you have faith. With gentleness and care, I believe our Lord is responding, if you have faith even this big, even this tiny faith the size of a mustard seed, if you have that, it is enough. Because even small faith can do great things, even if you can't believe it. Even small faith can do great things. And even your small faith is big enough to move the tree of anger that has taken root in your heart and to throw that tree into the sea of God's love. You do have the power to do that through the love and grace of God. You do have that kind of freedom. I think in so many ways you and I don't really understand what freedom means for the Christian. We think that freedom is the ability to choose to do whatever you want to do, but in the end we know that we live so much of our lives choosing wrongly, choosing anger or pride or vengeance or wealth over love of God and love of neighbor, over what love of God and neighbor demands of us. We choose wrongly. We want to choose not to forgive those who've wronged us because we think that gives us freedom to hold on to the hurt. But in actuality, our bad choices simply make us slaves to our anger or slaves to our selfishness or slave to whatever sin our bad choices lead us toward. We think we're free because we're making the choice, but in actuality, we're captives to our own fallen nature. Jesus tells us we should be like those who say we're worthless slaves. We've only done what we ought to have done, and we resist that kind of language because we want to be free. We don't want to be slaves. But are, are we really as free as we pretend to be? St. Augustine of Hippo and his writings often articulated a very different understanding of what freedom looks like for the Christian. Though we tend to think of freedom as the ability to choose between different choices, Augustine says that if you can work on keeping your true end in mind, that is, the true end of full love of God and neighbor, if you can keep that in mind, then you will have perfect freedom. He says that when we give ourselves wholly to God, when we are truly slaves to God's love, then we will only ever choose that which leads to true happiness. That's perfect freedom. We will only ever choose rightly. We will only ever choose that which leads us deeper into God's love. Freedom for St. Augustine is perfectly and always with a spontaneity and embrace, always choosing that which will really make me happy happy, that will really bring me into God's love. Freedom for St. Augustine is the inability to choose wrongly ever again. To put it another way, it's the perfection of an athlete who has gotten so good at their sport that they are incapable of hitting the ball poorly ever again. That's the freedom that Christ invites us to as slaves to love. Those who are slaves to God's love do not require recognition, do not require that others serve them. Did you notice that in Jesus' story, he begins by talking to his disciples as though they're the slave masters and then flips it on them and says that it is the slave who is the model of goodness, which is right up the alley for the Gospel of Luke, because in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is always lifting up the marginalized as the models of faith. It is those who are marginalized in the first century that are the models of the kingdom, whether they're the poor or the oppressed or the incarcerated or the women or the slaves. Those who on their margins 
understand God far better than those who have power. Those who are slaves to God's love are no longer capable of choosing anything other than the loving choice at all times and all places. And they know that that's where true freedom is found. Those who are slaves to God's love don't hold on to anger. They forgive even seven times a day. They'll forgive the same person. Because in giving up their own desires to choose anger, or greed, or whatever the sins are that you like to choose, in giving that up, we discover that perfect freedom is actually found in slavery to divine love. And I know it's true, all of this does seem a little impossible. But you know what? No matter how small your faith is, you have enough. You are enough. And you may not have faith, enough faith in your life, you think, to live as a slave to love forever. That may seem impossible to you. But take some wisdom, perhaps, from the 12 steps in recovery ministry. Maybe you don't have enough to do the right thing forever, but what about today? Today. You have enough faith today to choose to be a slave to God's love. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's got enough worries of its own. But today, you have enough faith to be a slave to God's love. You have enough faith today to even uproot whatever tree of sin is planted in your heart and cast it into the sea of God's love. You may feel like you cannot. You may feel like you're not enough. But you are. Jesus looks at his apostles so scared that they don't have that kind of love. And he says, it's there. It's there. It's right there within you. Even though it looks so small, it's there. And you can do this. You don't have to be a slave to all the false desires of this world anymore. Because you are enough. You have enough faith today in this moment to make the loving choice and then to see what tomorrow will bring. Amen.